Good afternoon, my name is Heather Milks, a junior from Budapest, Hungary, studying international development and religion, and I'd like to welcome you to the January series 2018. We'd also like to give a special welcome today to guests at three of our 52 remote sites in Rehoboth, New Mexico, Fremont, Michigan, and Chicago, Illinois. And now will you pray with me? God, our Father, we thank you for the gift it is to be together to learn more about our world. As we listen today, may we learn with our eyes wide open, ready to see how you may act and spur us on to love one another better. We are in a world that holds more than we can understand, filled with people with more hurt than we know. But we thank you for hope. Hope to know you restore all things. Hope to know you are the Lord that sees us. Hope to know that you can use us for your kingdom. As we listen today, give us wisdom to learn more about you and our neighbor. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. And now, Nathan Birma, educational technologist at Calvin Theological Seminary, will introduce our guest. Fifteen years ago, after graduating from Calvin College and moving to the near north side of Chicago, my wife and I began looking for a church. After several months, we realized we'd overlooked a church just three blocks away from our apartment building. LaSalle Street Church, with its unassuming name and its 19th century steeple dwarfed by a neighboring high rise on a busy street, doesn't attract attention. But as soon as we stepped inside, we could tell we were in the midst of a unique and vibrant community. We were amazed by how LaSalle seemingly effortlessly broke down typical barriers of rich and poor, black and white, lifelong and new worshipers. We were struck by the energy of LaSalle's fellowship, worship, and its preaching. When Laura Sumner Truax took the pulpit, she spoke with an uncommon blend of empathy, humor, boldness, and wisdom. We had found a church home, and we had found a pastor whose ministry would make a lifelong impact on us. We learned we had stumbled upon a historic era at LaSalle as the church would soon call Laura to be its senior pastor. We could tell then that her dynamic leadership and the church's mission were a perfect match and would bring years of fruitful ministry. Now, after years away, we still cherish LaSalle as a church home away from home. A few years ago, LaSalle Street Church started making national headlines for the story that you'll hear today. The church we barely noticed when we first moved in down the street was now being featured on Good Morning America, and the coolest church no one else had ever heard of was now the church whose crazy idea everyone was talking about. We were delighted. This pastor, this congregation, and this story of courageous generosity and kingdom abundance demonstrate humble witness to gospel hope for a hurting world. It's a story that deserves to be heard and celebrated and received as a call to all of us to live out a glad and generous faith. Laura Sumner Truax holds degrees from Loyola University Divinity School in Chicago and is working toward a Doctor of Ministry degree from Fuller Theological Seminary. She serves as teaching pastor for World Vision and the University of Chicago Divinity School. She is the author of a searing faith memoir called Undone, When Coming Apart Puts You Back Together and is co-author with Amalia Campbell of Love Let Go, Radical Generosity for the Real World. And Laura will be available in the West Lobby to greet you and sign her books immediately following today's presentation. Kelvin College is grateful to Holland Home and ICN Foundation for underwriting today's presentation. Please welcome Laura Sumner Truax. Good morning to all you very fine people of Grand Rapids. It is a pleasure to be with you today. It's a particular pleasure to be part of this wonderful series that's all about building um, better people and building a better world. And who is not down for that, huh? Who is not excited about being a better person in a better world? Especially right now when you stand at the beginning of a new year. Right now, when possibility is all we see in front of us, you and I both know that there's going to be a coming time when you're going to flip to July and start to sigh. <laughs> 
We both know that there's going to be a moment when you're going to look at May and think, how am I ever going to get this done? There will be a point this year, and maybe it won't be too far off for some of us, when we're going to feel buried under obligations and responsibilities, and we're going to feel as if there's too much that we're called to do with too little resources to do it with. But not today. (laughs) Not today on the second week of January, not on January 11th. At the beginning of the year, it feels like the whole year stretches out with possibility. I tingle with potential (laughs) in January, and maybe you do too. That feeling, that feeling where you're living in a world and anything is possible, that's the feeling I want to tap into today. That sensation of unfettered openness, that sense of possibility and freedom, that connectedness that arises not out of obligation and the knots of responsibility, but that feeling of connectedness that emerges from joy that emerges from desire and affection. Today, I get to bring a message that is rooted in experience and that is brimming with hope. And I have seen this message in my own life and in my church. I have seen it bridge divided opinions. I've seen it allow impoverished folks to feel like they were extravagant. And I've seen what it's meant to people's hope to their potential to be contributors to the world, the sense of meaning and purpose that it gave them. Today's message, I hope, is a message of challenge, of invitation, of transformation. I'm not going to pretend it's some silver bullet for all of our woes in society, but I am going to say with everything I have that it's a pretty darn good beginning. And it's a practice that if we put into place is capable of truly moving the mountains. Best of all, it begins with something that's already present in you right now. What if I were to say that right now, sitting where you are with the stuff that you came with and all the worries and all the other of, of it, What if I were to say that right now in this room, you have a superpower capable of improving almost every aspect of your life? That right now you have a power that is virtually guaranteed to make your life better. That you would literally flourish when you use this power. And not just you would flourish, but the friends of your friends would flourish. Researchers tell us that when we use this power already given to every single one of us, when we exercise this power demonstratively, we have increased energy, greater empathy, and more happiness. And in fact, studies show that people who regularly, on a disciplined kind of way, use this power, they are happier, they are healthier, they're less likely to suffer depression, and they even believe that they live longer than those who don't exercise this power. Would you believe it? (laughs) It sounds kind of crazy. Most of us would say no, that if there's some kind of power like that in us, we've already accessed it. (laughs) We have tried it and found it wanting. We don't believe it. Meaning that for most of us, this potential is just lying there dormant even though it could unleash all this goodness in our lives. Well, the superpower is generosity. It sounds putsy, doesn't it? It sounds unbelievable. What could possibly be so super (laughs) about this age-old virtue, huh? What could be so life-changing about old, same old generosity? Well, I'll tell you, I didn't realize this two years ago, three years ago, at the time we did our great experiment. (laughs) I just thought it was the right thing to do. But in the intervening window of time, I'm now up to speed on the research. Research, social science researchers are tripping over themselves studying generosity. And the more they find out about it, 
the greater the implications of the research. Let me just give you a couple of little tidbits on it. There's a research team from Harvard under the direction of Professor Michael Norton. They wrote a book about a year and a half ago called Happy Money. They did a series of experiments, but one that kind of caught hold and that caught people's imagination was that they gave free money to sports teams, to sales teams, and to randomly chosen individuals. Some of the recipients got restrictions on it. They were told that they were given the freedom to spend the money on whatever they wanted without any kind of uh, boundary. A second group got the money, but they were told, you've got to spend it on others. Both groups, the ones with the boundary and the one without, were told to spend it within a certain window of time. So again, one group, no restrictions, another group, same amount of money, but the demand was that they had to spend it on somebody else. Here's what happened. Repeatedly, those sales teams, they made more sales when they were told to give the money away. Those intramural sports teams, they ended up winning more than 25% more of their games. That's, a, that's kind of an amazing thing there. That just by giving money to these folks and telling them they had to spend the money on others, the sports teams became more competitive. They won 25% more. And to a person, individuals and groups said that they were happier and they felt closer to their friends and colleagues when they gave to others, even when they were giving to people that they didn't even know. What's going on with that? What's happening there? Norton and his group started to dig deeper into this. And they realized that those conclusions that they had found in Cambridge, Massachusetts, held true across the country. And more than that, it, start, it held true across the world. An 08 Gallup poll that looked at 136 countries around the world found that generosity made as much a difference in people's lives as doubling their household income. That's crazy. How could that possibly be true? That's transformational. The benefits of generosity, of a generous life, are demonstrative, they're verifiable, and they're authentic. And the thing is, it's right within our grasp. We seem to be literally hardwired to give. I started reading those studies, started listening to some of this research, and, and many of it's up on TED Talk, and you can just go crazy with this stuff, right? And I went back to the scriptures because I, I, I kept going back to one of our founding stories. You know, as a pastor and as a Christian, I, I love all this social research stuff, but I really love it when it validates something that God's already told us, <laughs> something that we may have forgotten way back in the day. You know this text. It's out of the first uh, chapter of Genesis, and you know the Genesis is giving uh, the, the story of how the Hebrew people understood their beginning how they understood the beginning of the world. This is a creation story. Now, other religions around that time have creation stories. The Egyptians have one. Other Mesopotamian peoples have creation stories. But they differ in some profound ways from the one that we get in chapter 1 of Genesis. And, of course, we're picking up the story near the end. After, six, uh, after several days of creating, God is now saying, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. And then dropping to 31, and God saw everything that God had made, and it was good. I just want to focus on a couple of things there. Back to this generosity piece, and seeing this verse, these verses, through that lens, God makes humankind, and the word there, bara, to form, that's the Hebrew word. God forms Adam, humanity, in God's image, Salum. And in that image, God puts its demuth, its likeness, God's likeness. Now, in the ancient world, there was a distinction between image and essence. An image 
was the model, it was the form, it was a container, so to speak, that would contain the essence. So here this understanding is that God is forming containers, calling them men and women. And those containers are going to have some of the demu, some of the lightness, some of the essence of God put in them. Now, in and of itself, that's not totally unique in the ancient world because the Egyptians believed that there were containers to hold God's essence, and the Egyptian called them pharaohs. <laughs> but the Hebrews knew something better. They knew that this godlike essence, this nature, God likes nature, wasn't just for kings, it was for everybody. There was an aspect of you and me, of our, of our very essential self, at our essential core, that relates to God, that's godlike. Alone in the world of ancient literature, this Judeo-Christian narrative describes a God who makes little containers and puts something of God's characteristic in each one of those little containers. And then what we see in these verses is that right after those little containers are made, this God, this creating, awesome display of power God, <laughs> then hands over this very creation, the stuff that God called good, the precious creation, hands it over to God's containers <laughs> and says, now do something with this. Now allow this to flourish. Now, now steward this. This beginning story is of a God who creates with such abundance and then generously, in a swooping act of generosity, just hands it all over to us. You know there's 12,000 species of ants? Isn't that crazy? 12,000 species. And you know who controls it? the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve? You know the, the beauty of the Grand Tetons, the wonder of this natural world, both big and both small, this God who, who, who in no small measure loves it, declares it good, came straight from God's hands, then hands it over so generously, so openly to just little containers, you, me, and the guy down the street. I kept coming back to this beginning story because I would call it a framing story. You know, in literature, there's these big stories that help explain the stories down the line. This is a big framing story. This story, to me, tells the fact that generosity is from the very beginning. That before we had this grip of scarcity on our lives, we knew some pleasure of abundance. That before we felt this spasm of self-protection, we knew a pleasure of plenty. That before there was a story of human isolation and fear, there was a better and more encompassing story of community and blessing. I am convinced that the reason researcher, research is now confirming that generosity is good for us is because generosity is hardwired into our essential nature. We are created in God's image, and God is a generous God. So yeah, when we start to live generously, we start to uncover this truth. We pull down the falsity of all these lies that we've been told, and we start to recover this joy, this essential joy that was part of this image and this essence all along. Okay, sounds great. Sounds beautiful. Thank you so very much, right? But we know that just because research tells us that exercise is good for us doesn't mean we all do it, right? <laughs> Just, be told, just because we're told we need to eat better doesn't mean that we're not going to go out and ba uh, grab a bag of Cheetos. I mean, this is who we are, right? And just because God's Word says that there's a better story out there, a better way of living, a more generous way of living, doesn't mean that we're all going to run out and do it. I get that. We don't follow that advice necessarily either. 
the superpower of generosity may be good for us, but it doesn't mean it's easy. And as my community of LaSalle Street Church learned, it can be downright difficult. It can be conflictual. It was the summer of 2014 when I learned that a housing development that LaSalle and three other churches had a partnership in building had been sold. We'd had a number of restrictions on the property. It was the first public and private and ecclesial partnership in the country. It opened for business in uh, 1980. It uh, was a mixed income, mixed race housing developed that flourished for many years. But after many years, the restrictions on the property were coming off. And uh, the main uh, investor was 65% was interested in selling. The, that's it in that little border right there on the screen. The development, it was unimaginatively named Atrium Village because of an open space in the center of it. <laughs> it was going to some Canadian guys. And, uh, and they had uh, not only purchased it, but each church that had invested in it stood to get $1.6 million. I received that message on a hot June day. It was a Monday morning, the time-honored pastor's day off, right? And our attorney who was in the negotiations texted me as the deal was being finalized. I was immediately flooded with amazement. That sum of 1.6 million was more than double our annual budget. I couldn't begin to even imagine the kind of goodness that that might release into the world. All the kind of ministry we could do, the kind of missionaries we could support, but right on the heels of being so thrilled, I remember feeling so apprehensive I had watched a neighborhood church that had slowly calcified under the financial blessing of a big endowment. I had been part of family squabbles involving inheritances. And I knew my dear, wonderful parishioners, delightfully engaged in causes all around the world, delightfully up to their neck in community programs, actively working for the kingdom of God, and each and every one of them with very strong dogmatic opinions about what we should do and how we should do things. So deep inside me, a question started to form. Will we survive this windfall? Now, isn't that a funny thing to be thinking? While you're holding the phone, Saying with a text saying that it's just sold 1.6 million is being wired into your account right now as I type this. I wondered, would we survive this blessing? After all, right then at that time when this uh, property sold, we were facing some pretty big church challenges. Our parking lot was being built over. It's kind of an existential threat for an urban church, you know. We had a big hole in our budget that was growing. We were in a neighborhood that was rapidly gentrifying and longtime members were moving out. There was a whole uh, point of contention about perhaps we should move out too. Not a argument or or a conversation that many of you churches I'm sure have had out there, right? And we always had bigger dreams than we could ever fill. There were lots of pressure points around this. And I have to say, not only did LaSalle survive, but we thrived. We thrived during this window, and I'm going to tell you some of the stories about that, and Ami Campbell and I write about that in that book, Love Let Go. As individuals and as a community, we emerged with a greater sense of connectedness, a greater sense of vision, a deeper respect for those around us, a reawakened awareness of how much beauty and goodness there is right there in the world. And I'm convinced that all of those graces only came about because we went back to that framing story. Because we went back to this fundamental posture of generosity. We went back to this blessing and how God had blessed in the Garden of Eden, this kind of open-handed way of holding these things. We wanted the Genesis story to be our story. Our first decision 
and one that surprisingly to me, because I didn't know anybody was going to know anything about it, but the decision that caught the attention of literally people all over the world, and it's with a lot of amazement that I continue to say that, was this decision to give the first 10%, $160,000, to every one of our congregates. We distributed $500 checks to folks on this first September morning. It was the morning when we broke the news of the real estate sale. Nobody outside of church leadership knew it was coming. By the time of the second service, we had people I had never seen in my life. <laughs> They were lined up outside Fellowship Hall, all declaring that they were longtime congregants of LaSalle Street Church. <laughs> the word had gotten out on the street that this was a church giving away free money. That was a crazy morning. But I'll tell you, it was a frightening morning for me, a scary morning. For me personally, it felt like such a high stakes moment. $160,000 is not chump change, you know? And even though I had convinced our board, because our board was all over the place, I mean, it, we really had to wrestle down this decision. It wasn't like everybody came to the table and said, oh, yes, let's give away the money. It was a, a, a protracted, intense, vulnerable, hard-hitting conversation. And even though we knew the reasons why we were doing it, and, and I, I walked into church that morning just reminding myself that, okay, first of all, and I can say this to a, a group of Calvinists, what a priesthood of all believers moment, huh? To, to show in such a clear, demonstrative way, church leadership trusts you. First thing we want to do on this money is tithe it back to you guys, and you do something good in the world with it, whatever God puts on your heart. So I knew that. You know, that was a reason in my head. A second reason in my head was that we were modeling Genesis all over again. We were showing the kind of trust in the containers of God, right, that God had shown back in the garden. And the third thing I kept reminding myself, this is going to show the rich diversity of how many ideas there are about building God's kingdom. Everything from shelters to homeless LGBT youth to fellowship of Christian athletes to missionaries around the world. All the people at LaSalle had a moment to kind of showcase these are the causes God has placed on my heart. Yeah, I knew all that, but still I walked in with sweaty palms and this pit in my stomach because the critique was still ringing in my ears, right? Because the stories that this isn't what you normally do were still blinders around my eyes. Because I had a lot of ego invested in this. And because I didn't want to be known as the, the pastor who squandered the money. <laughs> I was afraid. What we were about to do was really unusual. You know, it strikes me that doing anything that goes against the norm is a little terrifying. At least if you're a person who, you know, normally presents as somewhat normal, <laughs> which I think I do. <laughs> People who normally just buy the scripts that are sent to you, you know, who just kind of live out what, what's normally out there, you know. Let's be prudent, let's put some in this fund, let's do something over there, let's kind of, you know, save for the proverbial rainy day. It, it, this was so outside all of that. I suspect that that's what makes generosity hard for many of us. I suspect that's why, and, and I, you know, I, I'm not going to get all legalistic, but the best of our tithers tend to give no more than 2% of their income. And then, of course, we love to quibble about whether it's gross or net, right? <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's why generosity is so, we're so unaccustomed to the radicalness of it, because we don't hear those stories very often. And I think I have time to just give this quick aside, and I'll just do a shout out to this guy. I know many of you guys have read Philip Yancey. Well, I was in a conversation with Philip, and it wasn't a private conversation, it was a public conversation, so I think I can, I'm in fair ground saying it. 
But Philip was uh, talking about how, at least back in the day, a few years ago, you didn't get a deduction if you, if you gave away any more than 50% of your income. And I heard that, and I thought to myself, who would ever know that? <laughs> right? Who would ever know that little detail? I'm so glad we went against the norm because we would have missed some amazing things. We would have missed the story of this guy. His name is Steve Martin. Steve Martin had been at LaSalle for about 10 years when he received his $500 check. For about nine and a half of those years, Steve had been homeless. He was living under a viaduct uh, under Lakeshore Drive. A few months earlier, just a few months, that summer in fact, some church folks had helped him get a one room at the Y, which is where he was living that September morning. I suspect most of us could have seen Steve and thought, you know what, kind of you're the charity here. <laughs> you, it's okay, Steve. You've lived on the streets a long time. You're just trying to like get yourself in order, you know, maybe paying for therapy or, or whatever kind of essential needs you have. Maybe that would be an okay, reasonable thing to do. But Steve heard that story from Genesis. He didn't see himself that way. He saw himself on a world stage. This $500 allowed him to live large. So what Steve did with his check, he held it for a couple of weeks, and then he came back into my office. He didn't have a checking account, so we had to endorse the church back to the, he endorsed the check back to the church to get the cash. He, he took $400 of that cash, and he went up back to that viaduct. He rounded up his group of friends, and they all went to the movies that afternoon. And then he took them to what he called a real restaurant meal. And he told me later, when I was just filming a little clip on him, he said, for that afternoon, we were just a group of regular guys. That was a story that Steve started to live in. He passed away at the beginning of, of last year, of 2017. But you know, the thing he kept coming back to was this luxury he had, this wonderful extravagance he felt. And somehow it didn't go away for him. Even right up to his death, he was having people guess into his one room at the Y on his little hot plate making grilled cheese sandwiches for people. And he went back to this moment of love let go as being a turning point for him. Repeatedly, we found that folks gave to things that were close to their heart, like Steve with his friends, or like these folks. Fabulous couple, Eric and Rosemary Baker. They lived in a South Side Chicago neighborhood, often in the news for its overwhelming violence and its underperforming schools. Over the years, this couple kept choosing to live there, even though they could have very easily moved to another section of town. This couple combined their two checks. So they had $1,000, and it just sat for several weeks. They weighed all sorts of things. They weighed uh, Ceasefire Chicago, which is a, a violence prevention program. You know, they had a lot of experience with Ceasefire. They, they looked at tutoring initiatives that were going on in their local school. And while they were praying about that, violence struck again. And this time, it was the killing of a boy who had grown up right next door to them. Their $1,000 provided the funeral provided the repast for that family, offered this tangible expression of Christ in their midst. You know, there's a, a passage in 2 Corinthians, it's kind of, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, it's kind of the great fundraising passage, and if you're a pastor out there who's ever preached a stewardship campaign, I will bet that you've used some of that stuff out of 2 Corinthians 8. Paul's talking to the church in uh, Corinth, and he's talking about the need of the Jerusalem church. And he says, you guys, you don't get it. That their need, the Jerusalem church's need, is for your surplus. And your surplus is for their need. He said, it's this great way God has crafted this thing. Rosemary and Eric 
learned that. That Bible story, you know, that text, it came to life. It was embodied in what was unfolding in them. One other story uh, that illuminates this proximity piece. This is Miss Dora. She's a senior who lives on a fixed income in a public housing building that's kitty corner to our church. Miss Dora moved north to Chicago in the great black migration, you know, of the 30s and 40s. She spent her entire life working as a seamstress. She's always impeccably dressed, even now. A few weeks after receiving her check, Miss Dora made an appointment, wanted to come into my office, and wanted to pray with me. Dora's niece, a smart go-getter of an 18-year-old, had been accepted into nursing school. That niece would be the first one in a rambling family of aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews over the decades. That girl would be the first one to go to college. Scholarships had paid for almost all of it, and Miss Dora wanted me to pray with her to see if perhaps her check could go toward the niece's books. We prayed. We both believed that the Lord answered affirmatively. <laughs> <laughs> Equally wonderful was the way some leverage their social capital. And this is what the studies on generosity say, too, that there's no right way to do it. There's just a lot of wonderful ways that are all pertinent to each one of us as individuals, right? This is a couple, Rich and Becky Beam. They often look that lovely. Rich Beam is the uh, president of Chicago's Union League Club. It's one of the tonier private clubs in the city. He's an engineer. He's a patent attorney. He worked his way through public schools. And Rich understood that amazing thing that can happen when a well-deserving kid catches a break. So Rich and Becky pulled their checks, getting $1,000. They then canvassed other members of the Tony Union League Club. And they ended up getting so much money that it jump-started the Chicago Engineers Scholarship Fund a fund that goes to a graduating Chicago public high school student who wants to pursue an engineering degree. Again, unique, right? Uh, stories that emerged out of where people lived and what they brought to the table. Stories about a guy from Marriott matching his with many other people and creating uh, a new food system, delivery system, in a food desert out on the west side of Chicago. A man, Chris Ford, who was a volunteer football assistant. He's a real estate agent. So he used to wander around the city, and a lot of his properties were on the south side. A lot of them were in the area called Lawndale, which some of you may have been in and may know a little something about that neighborhood. And he was leaning against the fence, watching football practices. And when he got his check, all he could think about is, I want to invest somehow in this program, but how to do it? So he starts a fellowship of Christian athletes. And in so doing, other people got interested in that and started volunteering with that. And then come to find out the football coach is also the track coach, because that's just how it rolls down there, right? And the track team, as some folks found out when they came to some of those cross-country meets, the track team is running in high-top tennis shoes. So these guys, being runners themselves, started a collection of shoes in their offices, and so on and so forth, and this thing just kept rippling. See, this is the power of generosity, and, and we've, we've minimized it to think it's about a dollar here and a dollar there. It is about this opening up of ourselves to the other, and it's about other people seeing that, catching fire with that, and moving that ball forward. We also had big dreams that were complicated and still haven't happened. One woman who works in a Catholic university with an interfaith chapel, she had this big dream of, of being a generous space for the Muslim students. And the Muslim students needed to wash their hands before they do their prayers. So she just wanted to install a little sink next to the Interfaith Chapel. Sounds great, right? Sounds like the kind of generosity that starts to build a different kind of community, doesn't it? That's still tied up in bureaucratic red tape. <laughs> still seeking approval, still seeking more funds. But good ideas, all of them, good ideas. And here was one of our biggest learnings. And this is where I'll kind of like go to a close. 
it goes back to that it's terrifying to do the unexpected thing that I mentioned earlier. Generosity has a way of blowing the lid off our imaginations. We started to realize that the way things are, these systems, these divisions, these patterns, they're not set in stone. This is not, the way this world is, is not necessarily truth from on high to be there forever and ever, amen. These are constructs that we created from patterns and narratives that we were told, labels we learned, language we used. We realized as a community and individuals, we realized that there were injustices, that there were situations, that there were very structures that we could change. I know it sounds incredibly cliched to say, be the change you want to see in the world. <laughs> but you know what? That's what we started to understand. Not at a head level, at an experiential level. We could be the change we wanted to be in the world. So after the 160000 was given out, we still had what one senior was calling the big money, right? It was a little, a little, a little bit over 1.4 million, right? And as a church community, we started to discern what could these things be for us? What would that big money look like in the world? And we were all over the map, of course. We joined in prayer groups over half the church, which were a dinky church, were 300 on a good day. And when I'm kind of feeling generous with my language, I may say 325, 340. <laughs> but we're a little, uh, we're 300 and a little less in the summer. But everybody had an opinion, right? Over those nine months, as we started praying, as we started hearing these stories, and as this truth started to really work its way in our lives, we realized there's some of those things out there in the world that you see and you think, dang, man, why didn't somebody do something about that? We started to look inward and thought, hmm, maybe that's somebody's us. Let me give you one great example. One of those is this financial bondage that's created by payday lending institutions. Now, I'm not naive. We may be all over the map in this room on government regulations and such, okay? But God's word is pretty clear that usury and exorbitant interest rates for the poor have no place among God's people. I think we can all kind of amen that one, right? So a group of folks led by a good Dutch guy from Grand Rapids, <laughs> the perfect person in front of this one, <laughs> started fanning out around the city to see if we could do an alternative to payday lending. Because there's one on every fourth street corner in Chicago. Sure enough, after many months of research and talking with a lot of different ministries around town, we started this thing, this financial friend, the Financial Resource Assistance Network. It's proof that we're still as challenged with our names as we were when we named Atrium Village. <laughs> Fran opened for business with $100,000 in cash, a partnership with a community-based credit union, and a lot of goodwill. We had trained people in our church to be financial advisors, and the first loan was made to an older senior who lives on her $745 a month Social Security check. It costs her $30 to cash her Social Security check at her local payday lender. She then gets money orders, which cost $15 each, to pay her critical bills. Her money fees alone are close to $100, almost a seventh of her total monthly income. She was involved in our senior market ministry. The team, the Fran team was there just chatting, just kind of doing a little groundwork, just passing out some cards. And this lady said, you know, I'm really in a difficult situation. And she talked about her situation. They came around her. She got her short-term loan, but she also received some basic financial lessons from some good people who aren't trying to exploit her. That's powerful, right? This story of generosity is continuing. And it's continuing in ways 
I never would have imagined. Last November, just a few months ago, I talked with some folks from a big steeple church in St. Louis, Missouri. It was a conference call with a guy uh, from what they called their discernment committee. The church had received a surprise request. The pastor had read this book, Love Let Go, and had convened a group to discern what to do with this windfall that they had gotten. Here was their quote. It never entered our minds to give away the money, they told me, until we heard your example. Wow. That's just cool. <laughs> That's just really cool. We spent an hour talking about the process we used, some of the high points and some of those points that were not very high. <laughs> and it was really fun reliving the experience. And as we were wrapping things up, I, I said, so, you know, how much money did y'all receive? He said, we got 2.4 million from a guy who we thought didn't have more than $5 to his name. <laughs> I tell you what, I put down the phone that day and I just sat there. It was a similar message to what I'd heard from a church in Maplewood, New Jersey, and in Cincinnati, Ohio, and in Lake Wales, Florida. The message wasn't all that different from what a Baptist pastor in Texas had told me and the Episcopal priest right across the street. You know, remember when I said on the front end of this that um, generosity has a power to affect not just your life, but friends of your friends? There's, there's a, uh, a word for that. It's called, in social research, it's called the social contagion theory. It's a way of explaining how social behaviors transfer across members of a group or network, much the way contagious diseases spread. You know, we all know the theory of reciprocity, right? You do something for me, and sure, I'll do something back for you, and it's largely our two-way kind of connection. But what they've realized is that generosity moves it so far before the, beyond those two people. Social contagion theory suggests that one person's behavior in a single action, interaction of generosity, extends beyond those two people. It sends a ripple effect out there. When it comes to generosity, again, demonstratively, one act of giving ripples to three degrees of separation. In other words, your kind, generous act to me will cause me to be generous, which in turn will inspire an act of kindness on yet another person's part, which will once again inspire one more action before that a result starts to peter out. Social contagion. Jesus had another word for it. He called it the mustard seed. <laughs> a generous act, even a seemingly insignificant one, buried like a seed, bursts other acts, reaching far beyond the original source. The smallest gesture of generosity keeps erupting in acts of love. So let me close. Um, objectively speaking, our church is nothing particularly amazing. I mean, it was very heartwarming to hear uh, Nathan's introduction, and on occasion I experience us like that. <laughs> I mean, I am crazy in love with my people, but most of the time we bicker and we stew and we drive each other crazy. We're just like that, right? Um, just like anybody else. We are nobodies in this great narrative that God is writing. But God used us, used our acts of generosity to open hearts and minds. And this entire experience revealed to me again, people are starving to see the good news in action. They're starving for it. They are so hungry to see another narrative. They're, they're desperate seeking it. Their throats are parched for it. We've forgotten this framing story. We've forgotten 
that we were created to go over divides. We were created for connection and support. We've been blessed as Abraham was blessed to bless others. All this wonder, all this amazing gifts that each one of us in this room has received, gifts of mental abilities and, and energy and health and life and breath and resources, they were never created to be clutched. They were created to pass through us. To, for us to just be this permeable membrane that it just moved on through. That's what we tapped into. LaSalle had a public moment to just do what each one of us is hardwired to do. I'm so grateful we took it. The good news is that each one of us can take it too. You and I sitting in this room today, we have so much more than $500 or a combined thousand. We have so much more in worth than 160,000. You're, you're God's image, the container, the vessel. Put here in this time, made incarnate, in flesh, if you want to say it that way, for right now, at this moment in our history. You're created to show the world something of God. You have been given this ability to build a new future in time, in care, with heart, mind, and purse. You have the power to change the world. So be of good cheer. God is actively at work, and be bold, because Jesus already broke all the norms. <laughs> and live as generously as God has so richly given to each one of us. Amen. Thanks. Thanks. I'm Karen Salpi from the English department, and um, I have some questions, sure. or other people have some questions. Uh, several of our students have asked questions along the lines of what can a college student with limited financial and maybe time resources, um, how can they practice generosity? Yeah. Well, you know, generosity starts as a posture. And uh, I had the great pleasure of uh, chatting with students a, a few hours ago. Um, it, it starts with the disposition of being in the world. It starts with a way of really imagining yourself not being like this, but being like this. And when you start to frame yourself in that, in that modality, um, all sorts of things start to present themselves. Whether it's uh, the kid who just uh, in your class who just needs a little bit of help and do you have time to give them a few minutes to spare, you know? Or whether it's uh, down the road uh, when you have a little bit of extra money. It doesn't necessarily start with, with money, it starts mm -hmm. with posture. Uh, so I think that's something that starting now, modeling that, when it comes to a moment in time uh, when there may be something big on the line, you've already got the, the framework, you've already got the muscle memory. Yeah, good. Um, Shane Claiborne, your mm -hmm. friend said that yeah. giving money to someone can be a cheap way to help them or a way to pay off one's conscience if there's no real interaction with that person. Yeah. Uh, do you agree? Do you have a response? Wholeheartedly. I think generosity is so much for our benefit. Uh, it's so we get the pleasure of participating in this kingdom. But uh, it's it's clear to me anyway in the Gospels that Jesus came to save entire communities. And uh, the, the Jewish people at the time of Jesus did not have a government in place. They couldn't have uh, programs necessarily from a governmental structure that could in, embody their values, Jesus' values. Um, but we live in a different time and age now. And uh, I think absolutely we should be engaged in, uh, in crafting the kind of structures in society that can do the big battle, right, with a lot of this stuff, like payday lending, right? Mm -hmm. um, we could use some legislation around that, some regulation around that. I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, there was a question uh, from a student earlier, is there a line between aiding someone through charity and giving so much that it hinders them? And I think related to that is the question of, uh, are there kinds of giving that um, cultivate sustainability that, that, that are kind of investments in the future? 
Yeah, I, you know, that's uh, that old line, you know, teach a person to fish and they'll fish for a lifetime, you know, uh, give them the fish and they'll eat that one meal. I, I mean, we say that because there's some truth in that, right? Mm -hmm. um, we've, we are uh, fortunate to support three refugee families and we're learning that framework that helping can hurt. And always this respecter that uh, people are, are crafted to stand up you know, to stand up as individuals, to be self-respecting individuals. And always we need to be arcing toward that. That doesn't mean that the guy who's hungry outside the Jewel Osco doesn't just need a meal. You know, those things don't cancel each other out. Uh, I, I think we walk through that path wisely mm -hmm. and we don't necessarily say, oh, government should do everything or government, you know, and you do nothing. I, I think there's a, the path of wisdom is through the middle of that. Um, I struggle with the issue of, of tax deductions that, that's, I mean, what I say is if I get a tax deduction that can encourage me to give even more. It's a little bit possible that maybe I partly give because of the tax deduction. Um, <laughs> if those, go, and, and you mentioned Philip Jansen's kind of, yeah. yeah do, do you think that um, if tax deductions for charity go away that that will affect people or, and, and let, me, let me just extend this. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been some questions, and by the way, multitudes of questions coming in today, so I apologize if I, we don't get to ask them all. Uh, questions about motivation, and you sort of answered that at the beginning, that, that ideally it should come out of joy and thankfulness. Yep. Um, but can I say that that is ideally, it comes out of joy. I think you move into joy. You know, you all, I mean, we want to do 100 sit-ups too, right? But you don't start with 100 sit-ups. You start with just daily doing one, right? And, and, and I think that's the thing. We, we try to set up these false dichotomies, mm -hmm. right? But uh, the generosity is both this rich pleasure, but it's also a discipline, and that doesn't, that doesn't cancel each other out, right? Mm -hmm. So um, about tax deductions, you know, we, we've, every church leader is doing a deep dive into this. Um, there are some things I do because I, I just do it. Is it good for me? Yes, it's good for me, and it's good for the world. Do I think that it's helpful when, when government allows people to make choices that are good for them and good for the world? Yeah, I do. I support, you know, heavy taxes on cigarettes, for instance, because I don't think it's good for people, right? So uh, I, I think that we can support, mm -hmm. right, government offering ways for people to, to do good. Uh, I also say, and I'll be as fast as I can, that uh, I, I think we can, um, we can feel like somehow our motivation, we're going to reach a point where our motivations are 100% pure. They're not, right? We all know that we are complicated people. And, uh, and we just keep focused on Jesus and keep walking in that way. And uh, hopefully our motivations become increasingly purified in the light of Christ's love, you know? I have a couple questions here about what happened after Atrian Village was sold. It's a, it's a mixed income or was a mixed income community. What happened to the folks living there? Yeah, thank you. Um, and this is something I would really solicit your prayers on. We fought hard, uh, every one of the churches did, to put a new restriction on Atrium Village, on the new Atrium Village, uh, asking that not 10% be set aside for uh, low-income folks, which is the city of Chicago mandate, but rather 20%. We had a a contract. We had uh, that in legal writing. And uh, we heard this summer that the developer is trying to get out of that through a lot of different maneuvering. So uh, LaSalle and the other churches have joined back together. We just recently got some pro, bo legal, pro bono legal representation on that. And we're going to fight it with everything we have. Uh, we think that we have a legal argument. We also know that you know, we're a church of 300 people, and, uh, and this is the seventh largest developer in the world. So, um, you know, we might go down fighting on that one. It, uh, but keep that in prayer, because uh, that's, that's something we fought very hard for. And, uh, uh, and the people who, um, who were moved during that, because uh, it's being developed right now, and no new buildings have been uh, occupied yet. They won't be occupied until next summer. Um, the people who were moved out were moved to kind of a landing zone and were given first right to move back in. Okay. That's also in the contract, also what uh, the developer is trying to uh, wiggle out of. 
here's a question, and I'll preface it by saying that not too many years ago, Richard DeVos spoke at the January series, mm -hmm. and um, I don't remember if you talked about it in, the, in, in class or in the talk, but he mentioned that he's, he's quite a philanthropist in the community, and he gives publicly, and he says he gives publicly, wants people to know he's mm. giving, in order to encourage others to give, to say, mm. if he can do it, I can do it. Um, should we give publicly so others are encouraged to do the same, or privately to preserve humility like Jesus teaches in Matthew 6? Mm -hmm. um, what's yeah. your thought about that? Well, you know, there's two ways of thinking about that, of course, you know, have <laughs> you just named. Uh, there is a, a pretty big body of work that when Jesus is praising the widow's might, what he's really doing is complaining about the system that requires a widow to give her last few cents, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, and there are some thoughts around, like Philip Yancey, I'll tell you, that, that opened my imagination, right? And I'm sure if I was to hear Mr. DeVos speak, uh, that would have opened my imagination. So uh, again, like all these things, we, we think that we can have this one hard line and apply it to every single one of us in this room, but the reality is that following Jesus is more complicated than that. And I think there are some times when you need to stand up and say, and I've had to say, you know, my husband and I really believe in this. We believe in it to the, to the tune of X. Um, and then there are other times when that would have been hubris all over it. And, uh, and what we needed to do was to give, give sacrificially and give without anybody in the room knowing it. So uh, again, I, I, I'm sorry that we don't have those clear lines all the it's time, It's been a right? series of easy answers to easy questions, so <laughs> we think. Uh, Pastor Laura will be out front to sign books and greet you and answer maybe more questions. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank, Thank you. Thank you especially. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. I didn't leave as much time as I wanted. I'm oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs>